So I'm Pat Ryan. Um, I'm an environmental epidemiologist, again, from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital and the University of Cincinnati. Uh, I've been involved um, with the, the chief study, the Childhood Health Investigation and Exposure Follow-Up Study um, that I'm going to be talking about today. Since its inception, which I believe was 2009, uh, it was originally funded f under um, NIEHS's uh, Research to Action Program. Uh, and Grace LeMasters uh, and, and Brad were the, uh, the PIs, and, and um, uh, it's been a really great, great uh, opportunity for me. So um, just to, I know everybody's familiar with the ATSDR medical screening study, but I just wanted to, to point out a couple of um, uh, aspects of the ATSDR screening that, that I think are really important to keep in mind when we talk about chiefs, because originally we thought uh, the concept of CHIEFS was to follow up a subset of that medical screening study. So there were about 7,300 people that participated in the ATSDR medical screening study. Uh, 600 of those at the time were children, so they were between the ages of 11 and 17. Um, and the eligibility across the board was that you had to live or work uh, in Libby for at least six months before 1990. Everybody in the ATSDR medical screening study had a medical and exposure history, so questionnaire data about exposure pathways, medical histories, uh, and everybody had pulmonary function testing, including the kids, uh, but only the adults in the population had the x-rays um, for pleural plaques and, and interstitial fibrosis. And so all of those kids, at 600, uh, did not have any, any x-rays at the time. And I just wanted to, to highlight a couple of, of major findings. So this is the uh, paper that was published from the uh, study in 2003 in Environmental Health Perspectives. Um, just a couple of, of stats to, to think about. 75% of those uh, with the abnormalities, pleural plaques, were non-workers, non-family members. So uh, certainly some environmental exposures were occurring. And if you look, this is the, uh, a table from the picture. And, and I know it's hard to read. But what I've highlighted here are a couple exposure pathways that uh, probably took place uh, when they were children. So some of these things like playing at the ball field near the expansion plant. Uh, if you frequently uh, participated or, or reported doing that activity, 19% of those people had pleural plaques. Uh, playing in vermiculite piles. So again, these are, these are activities that we, I think, typically associated with uh, children. You know, children are engaging in these. And so, you know, we're a, a, a pediatric institution. Uh, Grace and I were really interested in pediatric health. Um, for a number of reasons, um, certainly, uh, you know, the lungs are developing early in life, environmental exposures that are occurring during those uh, developmental time periods could have long-lasting health implications. Um, there's obviously, we thought, a, uh, a potential for um, the exposures to be occurring through the, some of those activity pathways. Um, and in 2009, by that point, um, the kids that were in the ATSDR study were in their mid-20s. Um, so there were perhaps the potential for the latency period to be long enough that some of these health effects might be uh, starting to manifest. And would, we thought um, it would be a, uh, a great idea um, to follow up uh, that population. So there was also a study, this is a, 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 a paper that was published in 2010, also in environmental health perspectives. This is actually using the ATSDR data. Uh, and what they did was they honed in on um, people at the time that were uh, between the ages of 10 and 29. So not just the, the children, but children and, and young adults. And what they looked at in this analysis was um, the frequency of engaging in some of these activities and respiratory symptoms. And so you can see in this group of, of uh, people, um, you know, those that uh, handled vermiculite frequently, there was a, a threefold increased risk for coughing. Um, handling vermiculite, recreation along Rady Creek Road, um, uh, popping vermiculite. So all of those pathways seem to be associated with respiratory symptoms in, in, in a younger population. And so um, the idea behind CHIEFS was uh, to investigate the respiratory health effects that are associated with a childhood exposure to uh, Libby amphibole in people who are now young adults. So our idea was um, to recruit uh, young adults who had participated in the ATSDR medical screening when they were children. Those 600 were really our main target population initially in the chief's cohort. Uh, and then we also did open it up to uh, volunteers of a similar age and who also met that same eligibility criteria. So a lot of siblings, for example, um, were also enrolled in the study. So in the end, uh, and I'll show you all this data, we had about 300 uh, participants in the chief study and about 240 of those actually had participated in the medical uh, the ATSDR screening study. So about 75% or so. Um, and so for those folks, we actually can go back and look at longitudinal uh, data if we want. So we have longitudinal symptom data when they were collected 
uh, as children and now as, as young adults. We have uh, exposure histories reported by them at the time uh, when they were young children. Um, I'll just put a, a note in here, you know, it was a really interesting, fun study to do. Um, we worked a lot with CARD. Uh, the medical screening study data was ATSDR data, uh, and so we weren't allowed just to have access to the, the names and, and information of, of the, uh, the people that participated in that study. We worked with uh, uh, Ted Larson and ATSDR CDC, uh, what they let us do was to actually go to CDC and sit in a room <clears throat> with the files and look it up. And what we ended up doing was we mailed um, information about the study, not to the, the young adults that we were trying to recruit, but we actually contacted the parents. And then we asked the parents to pass along that information to their, to their offspring that participated. So it was a, kind of a circuitous, circuitous route to, to recruiting, but that's what ATSDR said we could do. Uh, and so we actually made trips to CDC, we wrote letters, we followed up by phone calls. It was a lot of, of uh, um, real intense recruitment efforts, not any type of study that I've, I've, I've done before. Um, and then we also did some recruitment here in Libby with CARD uh, through social media and, and newspaper advertisements and, and through the, uh, the, the CARD clinic. So. Um, We've collected a lot of information and data on these, on these young adults. Um, they came into the CARD clinic. They did a complete pulmonary health history uh, questionnaire. So I think it's the same questionnaire that everybody does, right? Um, so it's, it's uh, compatible to all the other uh, screening data that's at the CARD clinic. Um, a residential activity history, which I'll talk to you about. That's how we categorize or characterize exposure in the, in the cohort. We did spirometry. I know uh, Roy McKay came up here several times, I think, to really <clears throat> work on getting really high quality spirometry in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, um, uh, in the study. Uh, we've done a lot of work on exposure characterization. I have biological samples that were collected at the time. So I have blood and hair samples sitting in freezers at Cincinnati that we really haven't done much with. So if we're interested in looking at, and we'll talk about, uh, hopefully we'll talk about some future follow-up. Uh, we do have biospecimens sitting in a freezer, uh, you know, collected on, on these uh, young adults. Um, that we could potentially look for biomarkers of, of future disease. Uh, and then we did chest x-rays and, and HRCTs. <clears throat> so here's the, an overview of, of who, who these, these young adults were. They were about 25 years old when they participated in the study. Um, you can see they were born mostly between 1980 and uh, 1990, 98% of them. Um, we had smoking status collected. Uh, and here's the health outcomes that we saw. So these were read, the H, HRCTs and the x-rays were read by B readers um, looking for typical asbestos-related diseases. And so using that criteria, we didn't see any uh, uh, pleural changes or interstitial changes on either x-ray or HRCT. So that's, that's I think, good news uh, initially in this cohort. Um, however, if you look at, at some of these uh, symptoms, I don't know if I can pull out, <coughs> You know, Brad just talked about this pleuritic chest pain, and I think that's, that's the symptom that really popped out to us. Jim Lockey um, was really concerned that that was one of the very first symptoms that he saw in Marysville before he saw any sort of pleural disease um, was this presence of, of pleuritic chest pain. And so, you know, 23% of the cohort re reporting pleuritic chest pain, and it's a pretty severe phenotype. It was, uh, we defined it as, as having a pleuritic chest pain that lasted more than 24 hours or four or more times in the past year. Um, so pretty debilitating chest pain and 23% of the population reporting that uh, in their mid-20s. <clears throat> so I'll just run through some of the results and, and the way that we've characterized exposure in the study uh, and, and, and linking those to our health outcomes. So we collected uh, similarly to the ATSDR medical screening study um, pathways by which we thought the young adults could be exposed to Libby Amphibole uh, during their childhood. So this is questionnaire-based uh, data. We asked them to report time that they spent uh, in the attic with visible vermiculite, playing or watching games at the downtown ball fields, all those same exposure pathways that, that were uh, originally asked in the ATSDR medical screening. And you can see here the, the um, most common ones uh, you know, 64% of them said that they played or watched baseball games uh, at the ball fields downtown. 45% uh, of them said they played in or around vermiculite piles as children. This is all as children, so before the age of 18. 35% um, of them said they lived in a, in a home with indoor visible vermiculite. 
Only 8% of them shared a household with a, a, a worker and, and so on. So here's the, uh, the pleuritic chest pain. And what we're looking at here is just whether or not they reported uh, participating in any of these uh, uh, pathways. And what you can see here is I've highlighted the, the significant uh, relationships between the, the symptoms and the pathways. And uh, for uh, pleuritic chest pain, we had four pathways uh, pop up, recreational activities near Rainy Creek Road, heating uh, vermiculite to make it expand or pop, uh, sharing a household, uh, and so on. And then the other, the other ex uh, uh, symptom that seemed to pop up a bit was shortness of breath uh, with a number of, of these pathways as well. We, we, we categorized it a little bit more uh, finely by asking how often they engaged in these uh, activities. And then we categorized that as, as a sometimes or frequently. So very similar again to the way ATSDR did this. Uh, and we did see some, some relationship with, with um, seemingly higher risks among those that, that participate in the activities frequently. So for example, here's playing in and around vermiculite piles. Um, it was a two and a half fold increased risk for pleuritic chest pain if you, if you reported doing that activity frequently. Um, similarly, playing or a, a heating vermiculite to make it pop. Um, you can see it was the frequent category that, that seemed to be uh, uh, most associated with, with some of those health outcomes. The other thing we did was we spent a lot of time trying to somehow quantify um, their exposure. So to put an actual number to those activity pathways. Uh, and so we did this sort of like a, a job exposure matrix approach, if you will. So if you think about each of the activities, uh, what we wanted to do was we asked the, the participants how often they engage in those activities uh, and then we assigned a quantitative estimate of a fiber exposure that they might be getting when they, when they participated in those activities. And the way we did that was uh, a combination of uh, utilizing data collected here in Libby from the uh, US EPA Contaminant Screening Survey, the CSS, and then some activity-based sampling that was done here in Libby. Uh, and we did that whenever we could. We tried to use data from, from Libby itself. And then for some of these exposure pathways, we weren't able to get any sort of a quantitative estimate on what the exposure might look like from data here in Libby, so we turned to the literature. So for example, and I'll show you, uh, uh, playing in attics or being in an attic near uh, visible vermiculite, there was a study that was done in New England where they actually simulated um, you know, attic exposures due to visible vermiculite uh, in the uh, insulation in the attic. So we use data like that. <clears throat> so I know this is, again, is too hard to read, but um, just so you know, and it's in the paper that's in the folder, every single one of these pathways, we have an estimated fiber exposure um, that was associated with that pathway. There's a, 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 an explanation for each one of them, how we came up with that, the citation for the information, we put some boundaries on this because some people said they started engaging these activities when they were you know, a year old or two years old. So we went to EPA uh, activity-based data. So they actually have a database of when people start doing certain activities. Uh, so we went to that and then we, we bounded some of that data based upon that uh, database. We also put limits on how often they could actually do this. So some reasonable limits. So obviously, I don't think you're mowing the grass here uh, you know, 365 days a year. Uh, and so we put some, some boundary limits on how often they said they could do that <clears throat> to, bring, to bring some of those, some of those odd questionnaires responses back in, in line. So every one of these uh, has a quantitative estimate that we applied and it goes on, you can see here. Um, and then we just multiplied the two of them together. So the number of activities, just like a job exposure matrix, the number of times you did something times that quantitative estimate to sort of weight the activities, if you will. Um, and then we added them up to get a cumulative exposure as well. Um, and then I'll go ahead and just show, so this is what the, the data looks like. Everybody reported some of these activities, right? So uh, nobody had a cumulative exposure of zero in our, in our cohort. Everybody did some activities. The activities that, that, that were um, the, associated with the highest exposures you can see here, um, uh, being in the attic near visible vermiculite, playing in piles, uh, and then this is the cumulative, uh, the range of cumulative exposures. Um, and then if we look at each one of those activity pathways uh, and pleuritic, and, and all of our symptom data, um, this is the results for the, the pleuritic chest pain. I'll just point out a couple um, that were statistically significant, uh, an increased risk um, with gardening, 
Um, the activity, the cumulative activity was not significantly uh, associated, but, but popping uh, vermiculite was significantly associated with, with the uh, presence of pleuritic chest pain uh, in, in young adults. Regular cough, you can see similar results. I'll note that, you know, it's pretty consistent. They're elevated, um, though uh, not all of them statistically significant. I think shortness of breath, we saw uh, a significant relationship here with the cumulative estimate of, of exposure, uh, and then wheezing or whistling uh, in the chest, um, uh, a little bit lesser uh, significance uh, across the board there. So our key takeaways, um, I think <laughs> I got a call the other day from a reporter. I was in uh, one of the newspapers here, I think, and uh, <clears throat> they, I, I saw it as I checked into the hotel, and the, the first thing they said was, it was mixed news. I think it was mixed news. Um, you know, we didn't see any pleural interstitial changes from the imaging studies, although I will note they weren't read the same way, uh, and that's one of the things we've talked about before. So maybe um, looking at some of those imaging uh, a little bit more closely might be interesting. Um, our takeaway, the pleuritic chest pain was, was most concerning to us. Um, it seemed to be most linked to uh, activities near Rainy Creek, heating vermiculite, and sharing a household. Um, you know, we, Jim, was, was very concerned that, the, that this might be a clinical feature um, involving some inflammation of the lungs that might be really indicative of uh, future pleural disease, like, like you said, Brad. Um, and he also noted that when he started the, the, the study at, at Marysville, that that's, that's the hallmark. That was the first symptom that, that the workers uh, started to report. So um, somewhat concerning there. Uh, I think, you know, one of the real issues with, with this in epidemiology and this type of epidemiologic study, um, you know, and the reviewers when we submit grants now and, and the paper as well, really are concerned with recall bias. Uh, and so getting some objective outcome data rather than re relying solely on symptom data would be great. And I think that's something we have to think about going forward. Um, and then obviously there's assumptions that we made when we did the quantitative estimates. Um, we've tried to do some autoimmune studies. So Gene and I have submitted a grant a couple times to look at that. Um, unfortunately, haven't had success yet, but we do have um, uh, the blood sitting in freezers. I also have the blood from the OM Scotts facility uh, and all the workers there. Um, and so if we wanted to think about, and that's actually what we proposed to, to do, is, is to look at um, autoimmune markers in, in these two exposed populations, one in occupational exposure with well-characterized well occupational uh, exposure histories, um, and then the chief study. And I think that really would be fruitful if we could think about going back to that again. Um, you know, maintaining the cohort is always difficult. The study ended, I think, in 2012, 2013, somewhere in that range. Um, and personally, I think it's time to go back to it. You know, here it is 10, 12 years later since we've done these studies, uh, and it would be nice to, to revisit that uh, and to see what's going on, especially with those that have the early um, uh, pleuritic chest pain and potentially looking at, at biomarkers. 